you know, I think that you guys should go into college. If you're watching this as a high schooler or freshman or sophomore in college, it's okay to not know what you want to do. Totally okay. It's okay to graduate and not know what you want to do. But at the very least, guys, I'm going to sound like a older cousin or uncle. Like you guys should have a plan to figure out what you want, right? Have some sort of idea. You can be like, these are the three or four things I'm most passionate about. Let's see if I can actually make a career and living out of this. Welcome, 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 guys. Today I am joined by Julia Sun. Julia is currently a senior, got into Cornell. Are you going to Cornell, Julia? Is that- Yes, is that I'm pretty committed. <laughs> pretty committed, all right. Yeah. So we'll do a bit of a different style today where I'll ask Julia one question and then she'll shoot back another question for me. So it's kind of like a mutual interview, I guess. Yes. So we'll start with Julia. Obviously this, this channel's primarily meant for a high school audience. I have uh, a very spicy question for you, which was, how did you get into Cornell? <laughs> I didn't get into Cornell. I have no idea how to get into Cornell. How did you do it? Did you have a strategy? Did you even apply to Cornell? No. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I did early decision to Cornell and the early decision for Cornell is like, is, is, Ivy League acceptance rate is obviously low, but compared to like a lot of the colleges, it's pretty high, I would say. It's like 20, 25% acceptance rate. It's probably lower this year. But um, yeah, so I edited Cornell Engineering last semester and I got in in December, I think. And how did I get in? I don't think I had a strategy. In the back of my mind, I just always wanted to go to Cornell because in eighth grade I did like a science project about food and then the teacher was like oh yeah like email like college professors to give you guidance or something so I emailed Cornell's like food science professors and they were really helpful and then I got really interested in food and stuff so I was like well Cornell has like food science so that definitely want to want to be there so how did I get in um I think I made sure to like obviously have a lot of like leadership positions and like awards like national international regional awards as well uh, on the common app there's like an activity list the first activity i put was like i founded like a nonprofit. it's called first gen support we try to like provide opportunities and resources and sharing stories to empower first generation low-income immigrant students I started that last summer and I also wrote my essay on that. I didn't want to start that organization at first, but my friend kind of convinced me. So I kind of wrote my essay on like why I didn't want to start and why I started that. So that kind of made me stand out as well. But overall, I just had a lot of like, try to have like leadership positions. You don't have to necessarily found clubs, but I, I also like kind of like started one STEM club and just as make sure to have like leadership positions, I guess. Yeah. Well, tell us more about the STEM club you founded. What was that about? No, I kind of founded it. It was like started by like two seniors, I think the year when, when I was a junior. So it's called Girls to STEM. Basically, it's a middle school outreach club. Basically, they just like Zoom with like middle school girls teaching presentations, lessons uh, for that. This year made it like kind of successful according to like quarantine standards because you know not a lot of people have zoom fatigue right they don't want to like go on zoom but we like expanded from last year when it was in person we only had like two or three girls but we extend it to you know like we have like 20 to 30 members in our club right now wow. and about like five to seven like girls come frequently to our meetings so it's very i would say kind of success successful compared to a lot of like um clubs during quarantine. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So just to recap, applied early to Cornell engineering. Um, yes. I think that's a really smart strategy. Like you mentioned, it has a pretty high acceptance rate. I mean, compared to, uh, it just has a higher acceptance rate compared to regular decisions. So the odds are much better. Definitely apply early guys. And it looked like the initiatives that you started really revolved around this identity of bringing the people around you up, porting FGLI supporting people kind of like like yourself so I think yeah. that leadership and initiative definitely definitely helped uh, whether you had a strategy or not it kind of came together right. <laughs> yeah it just kind of came together last minute yeah do you have a question for me <laughs> yeah how did you take advantage of the resources at your college and like how did you get the most out of like Yale like freshman year or like 
throughout the four years you were there? Yeah, so I am probably not the best person to ask. I really don't think I took that much advantage of resources at Yale. There's lots of money. There's lots of scholarships. There's lots of fellowships. Maybe not too many scholarships. I guess the aid is kind of baked in. Lots of fellowships, money given to you to go travel, to go study abroad. And I did none of that. And it's probably my deepest regret when it comes to my college years. However, there were other little competitions. This was not little. It was about like a $15,000 fellowship again for entrepreneurship. And that's something that I was really interested in and gunning for. Uh, I was a part of that. And I, I think we took advantage of almost every entrepreneurial resource at Yale. So I'm proud to say at least at least we did that. However, yeah. um, if you guys are not entrepreneurial, you know, there's so many sources of funding, whether you guys are working on an art project uh, or you guys want to do community service, there's so many different ways. If you look for it, the money is there. If you look for it, the people are there. Sometimes even better than money is the advisor uh, and the faculty mentorship the school provides. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be faculty either, but you could find an older student. You could find someone who's in graduate school to help you out with your initiative. So I would say that the greatest resource is probably the community. Like you graduate and now I'm alone. I'm in Brazil. I don't really have a community. I can't bounce ideas off of people. I can't just like walk into a dining hall and ask people about like their astrophysics research or, you know, the kind of food policy initiative that they're working on or sustainable farming or things like that. So for me, I think that was honestly the, the greatest resource, the human resource, the human capital of such a wonderful university. Just having so many young, beautiful minds like in one place. Um, my mom always made this joke about like me trying to get a girlfriend in college. And she was like, oh, you, you're like, you will never find so many other like young, beautiful, talented, smart like girls uh if you can't shoot an animal in a zoo like how do you expect to shoot one in the wild i was like okay thank you mom for that vote of confidence Wonderful. but how do you make the most out of out of freshman year like when i went in i really thought that the best part of yale would be the people so i was setting up meals i would like go on these unofficial dates hit people up like guys girls be like hey you guys want to go grab dinner in the dining hall just like one-on-one -on -one or in small groups and just try to talk to like three new people every single week and for me i kind of treated it like a video game but I did get kind of burnt out by that. I was always in this mode of like, oh, I need to meet people. I need to meet people that I didn't quite take time for myself to just be alone and think. And there's this pressure to always be somewhere, do something while you're in college, which I don't think is necessarily the healthiest mentality. So I think that balance is really key. But yeah, that's a great question. It's going to be different at every college. I can only speak for Yale. At Yale, there was a lot of different kinds of funding. There were all kinds of opportunities to study, to travel. As you well just as like course. search up on, on their website and being like, hey, this is what I want to do. Or did you like ask people? Did people tell you things? Yeah, a combination of everything. I mean, sometimes there's just straight up flyers. I'm like, please study abroad. Please, please apply for this fellowship. Um, wow. Literally like flyers on campus or like at the beginning of a Chinese class, our teacher would, would go on like a 10 minute market, marketing spiel and be like, do this fellowship. It's one year. It's like totally paid. They pay you more than what we make at Yale. Like, please do it. They were marketing. I mean, th there were so many opportunities. It was, you were like inundated. You were flooded with things you could do. And mm -hmm. I wish I could go back to Yale and do it like three more times because I would. And I would do it like two differently each time. Uh, I'm going to ask you another question, Julia. We're just going to ping pong back and forth. <laughs> sure. And, uh, my question for you is just like, take us back to high school, Julia. I mean, technically you're still in high school, but mm -hmm. I want to know more about how was uh, being an FGLI in, in your high school? Also tell us a little bit more about like the high school you went to, where you're from, you know, what kind of struggles did you face? Was your road to Cornell, would you say it was an easy one, hard one? What do you, can you talk to us a little bit more about that path? For sure, for sure. So um, I live in suburban Chicago and I live in like a pretty white privileged neighborhood. My high school was pretty, it had a lot of AP classes, has a lot of good resources, I would say. Um, but I don't think in my opinion, it had a lot of support for first generation low income students. I mean, I, I took a lot of AP classes and a lot of my friends are like pretty privileged as well. I felt like I didn't really have any guidance when other people had money to do private SAT tutoring. I was just like doing Khan Academy, which is like free. I also immigrated here when I was nine. In middle school, I didn't really like speak English very well, I would mm. say. Uh, I like, I, I tried really hard to like study English and everything. My parents are like also kind of lost on like, I, I remember freshman year, my mom was like, oh, Julia, you should like take like easy classes so you can get A's. And I was like, no, I guess like YouTube helped me a lot. I'm so glad you're making such great, genuine, honest YouTube videos to help with the next generation of um, college students. Yeah, YouTube helped a lot, I would say. My counselors didn't really like give a lot of advice 
I, I have a follow-up question. Like what YouTube things are you searching for? Like what content was the most helpful for you? I want to know so I can make more of that content too. For sure, for sure. I think I started with like how I got into like this university kind of thing. How to like write essays. It's like once you get into that college video loop, YouTube will just feed you a lot of like different college videos. Let me hit you with another question. I think you ended your last question with like, oh, I, if I could go back to Yale, like I wouldn't have like lived like a different path, I guess, well, not a different path. Like what would you have done differently in college looking back now? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, this is a great question. So like I mentioned, studying abroad, there is an amazing fellowship where you can go study abroad for a semester in China, you could go for a year, you could even go for two years. I really wish I had taken advantage of that. And it's totally all expense uh, paid for, you know, from dorms to your books to flight tickets, everything. Fortunately slash unfortunately, I mean, I was busy, I was working on a startup, and I didn't want to just abandon my team in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. uh, New Haven, excuse me, while I was frolicking in, in Beijing and eating like you know, duck and while they were toiling, no. that would have been not cool. So that's one thing I regret. And basically all of you guys who are in college, please, 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 Pinky promise me, like I need you guys to study abroad. Probably the best thing you can do during your freshman to sophomore summer is study abroad. Your school will pay for you, number one. Number two, you'll get credits, which means the rest of your time in college will be easier. So one of your semesters, let's say, you know, sophomore, junior year, instead of taking five credits, five classes, now you're just taking four that's a big difference that's an enormous difference it can, it can literally save you six six to ten hours a week that's like a big deal what else what else what else I mean Yale has a phenomenal drama program and I tried out for some humor some comedy sketch groups sketch comedy groups <laughs> But I uh, wasn't a part of them. And I guess got a little bit demoralized and kind of intimidated and scared. I was like, oh, these other kids have so much experience in the performing arts. And I just kind of sold myself short. But yeah, I wish I had put myself more out there and tried out for different groups. Um, one of my closest friends, actually, she tried out for like 20, 30 groups, like every single year, I think maybe her freshman, sophomore and junior year. I was like, wow, she has wow. just such courage and, and guts. And I wish I was more like her. So if somehow I had snuck into the drama program or performing arts, just got in, in some way involved in drama, like YouTube is a lot of drama. Like I talk to the camera. <laughs> I'm, I'm a crazy yeah. person to sit in a room and I talk. I mean, even a drama course or a speech making course, theater, stage production, camera, lighting, angles, anything that would have helped me. Like, this is what I do now, all like several days a week. So that would have been great to, to, mm -hmm. to know. What else would I have done differently? I also wish I had taken my academics a little bit more seriously. Like Yale clearly had some amazing courses and I was really lazy and I wanted to just cruise through. So I didn't want to take the hard but enriching courses. I was, I mean, I was also running a startup, Julia, at this time. Yep. And I wasn't at Yale for like two weeks. Like I would just be traveling. There was one week when I was in four or five different states in one week mm -hmm. and I was just totally off campus. So I was trying to take the easiest courses where I didn't have to show up. I could just like send in my papers from far away, uh, get them graded and, you know, get a solid B plus, A minus, and then graduate on time. Because I didn't want to take any time off either. Although that's another thing that I recommend. You guys could go abroad and then also take a gap year and like go work. That's like such a cheat code because when you guys go work during your fall and spring semester, when everyone else is in school, guess what? No one's applying for those jobs. So it's like so easy to get an internship and it just makes your life so much easier. You can get like some really competitive stuff if like you just took a year off and you talk to the right person, establish connection. That goes a long way because employers do not care about your GPA. They, they literally don't even look at your transcript. They care about your GPA just like it has to be above a 3.5. Yale, lots of great inflation. I think that the average GPA is like a 3.7, 3.6. Not trying to make your life difficult. I don't know if that's true, actually. And let me look it up real quick. You also need to spill all the Cornell tea after this interview. <laughs> um, I mean, I'll talk about it right now. It just, I think there was a lot of um, suicide and depression at Cornell. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like number one in the nation for suicide rates. And they have the trenches, like the little nets underneath the bridges. Yes, um, they do. So, I mean... Obviously, no one is really jumping off in the summer, although they told us if you do jump off, what happens? An alarm goes off and the, the net wraps around you like a spider so that you can't roll into the ravine. And then uh, emergency like EMS squad comes and like picks you up. That's just very depressing to be walking 
across a bridge and see that and be reminded that like, oh yeah, people have attempted suicide here and that's why we have a net. I was like, that's why I didn't even apply to Cornell, frankly. Although I know that the hotel administration school is really nice and their business program is actually really, really good. But it was just too far away, too secluded, too cold. I'm from Florida, so it didn't make my list, unfortunately. But I'm sure you'll be happy there. Wow. <laughs> After all of that, you just let me know. I'm sure you'll be happy there. Yeah, yeah I was there. They like I, it. I, 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 yeah, a lot of thoughts went through my mind after I got in. Like, I mean, I was like happy. What was it like getting in? Do you remember? Well, you know, when did they tell you? What was that day like? I actually don't remember which day of the week it was, but I remember um, I just finished a math team practice. Um, I was like off Zoom. I was like, oh, I need to check my acceptance no decision letter. And then I remember I prayed before. <laughs> I, I prayed before. I was like, you know, Julia, you didn't, you're like kind of dumb. You didn't write any of your other college essays. So your whole winter break is going to be ruined um, if you don't get in. But, you know, if you, if you don't, get in but it's, it's fine if you don't get in because you're probably gonna finish all your essays anyways and you have rd and you're probably gonna like look into like more options and like decide later and stuff and then i was like kind of scared both ways <laughs> getting in and not getting in but i looked at my decision it was acceptance i was like oh my god i was so happy so then my parents are like also very happy and I FaceTime a lot all my friends and they're like screaming at the top of their lungs. Like, oh my gosh, I knew, I knew I believed in you. Like literally like I knew we'd get in. So <laughs> I remember talking to you, I remember discovered Kevin's YouTube um, channel and then Kevin was like saying like the bother Kevin Cadley like link. Like I think that's like the first time I talked to you. And then yeah, I think I think you also believed in me. <laughs> Remember. I mean, you told me your extracurriculars and your profile a little bit. And I was like, yeah, you have a really, really good shot. Super smart to apply ED to Cornell. I mean, statistically, you have like a one in five chance, which is super high. Other things that just like keep working in your favor, like all the extracurriculars that you're doing and um, the recs, they just kept, keep adding to the likelihood that you're going to get in. Realistically, for me, I was like, this is probably like a one in three, one in two shot that you'll get in, which is like good, really, really good odds. Yeah, that was a question I was going to ask you, which was like, you know, do you remember the day that you got in? So if you want to ask me another question. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, I guess, how did you figure out what you want to do in life? Yeah, I, I've always really been interested in teaching. So for a long time, I considered becoming a teacher. I've looked at uh, TFA, Teach for America, considered teaching at like a really like, you know, bad public school. I shouldn't say bad, but you know, they need teachers, they need someone to go there, which was kind of a tough thing for my low income family. Family, they were like, bro, you know, bro, I thought you were going to send money home. Like, I didn't know you were going to become a teacher. And I was like, well, I'm thinking about it. I'm either going to be an investment banker or a teacher. That was like some of the ideas floating around in my head when I set foot at Yale. Very quickly discovered that I didn't want to be a banker. I, I really enjoy business. And actually, I found this intersection, this marriage between education and business. And that's kind of what I'm doing now, right? Like I started my own tutoring shop, um, but that was the result of tutoring for hundreds of hours. I think maybe even over a thousand hours at this point, I started tutoring unofficially when I was in high school, just helping kids in the dorm and then tutoring, tutoring very officially while I was at Yale. Suddenly I had this like brand name, like Yale tutor, even though I was like one year older, maybe even like six months older. And it's not like I gained hundreds of hours of experience, but all of a sudden people want, were like frolicking, to this person's company. She hired a lot of Ivy League tutors. It was Chinese American Ivy League tutors for Chinese American kids in middle school, primarily in the South. They were, the parents were willing to dish out quite a bit. I ended up tutoring and I was always pushing myself to think like, you know, under what circumstance would I be like one of the best tutors ever? Like, what would it take for a parent to be like, I want to follow Kevin to the ends of the earth. And this was kind of like my entrepreneurial mentality. Like, how do I build loyalty? Same thing with the YouTube channel. I was like, how do I build loyalty and win these guys Parts over like oh I could offer like a personal Calendly link and meet with you guys and chat with you yeah. guys that's what I'm thinking about when I'm starting these initiatives so I was like you know what I need I need to get these kids national awards I was like if these kids win national writing awards they will follow me to like the ends of the earth and that's exactly what happened I got a few kids to win national awards and they started telling like all their friends about it and I started getting like a lot of students so I was tutoring you know, like 10 to 12 hours a week. I had like 20 students and I was making like pretty good money. I think at that point in time, I was sophomore in high school. Maybe even, I, I think I got this gig when I was a freshman. So I was 17 years old and I was making like 50 an hour. 
which is, you know, more than like my lawyer sister makes. So I was like, okay, maybe there is a way for me to make enough money to support myself as a tutor. That's kind of what I've been working on over the last year. Technically over the last four or five years, I ended up splitting, parting ways with that old tutoring company and setting up my own shop last year, exactly at this time when the pandemic hits, because I came home and I thought I was going to go to Amsterdam for spring break. That trip got canceled. Then my parents lost their jobs. So I started a tutoring company and decided to stay at home and, you know, support them by tutoring. And I started a tutoring company literally from my like childhood bedroom in Miami. And all I had was Zoom. I didn't even pay for Zoom. I was still using Yale Zoom. This is still Yale Zoom. <laughs> I still have not paid for Zoom. Really? Thank you. Daddy Yale for sponsoring my Zoom. Yeah, they maintain our email and Zoom and a lot of those things one year after you graduate. So you still get those benefits. You know, there were other things that I discovered at Yale where I was like, I clearly don't like this at all. I tried economics, total waste of time. I was like, please shoot me, like executioner style. This is ridiculous. Like I'm in this classroom, just melting. I feel like a piece of cheese, just melting. <laughs> like I could not have been more bored. I read the economics textbooks. The teachers were not that great. And I was so disenchanted at that point. And I knew for one of the majors was global affairs, international relations, which I had originally applied for when I went to Yale. One of the requirements is you have to take intermediate microeconomics, which is just like a killer course. I was like, I don't even want to major in this anymore. If I have to take intermediate micro, like, please just let me out. I let me do something else. As it turns out, I became an East Asian studies major, which was way more fun. So yeah, I mean, I, I remember, you know, like bitching and complaining to my freshman counselor. I was like, I haven't discovered anything. Like all the classes I've taken have been pretty like dog water. And he was like, bro, you are so lucky. I was like, what are you smoking? Like, what are you talking about? And he was like, no, listen to me, knowing what you don't like is just as valuable as knowing what you do like. And then I thought about it for several months and I was like, actually, dude, that makes like a whole lot of sense. And sophomore year, I decided to take Chinese because that's a whole other story, but my mom forced me to take Chinese and I loved it. It was probably one of the best courses I've taken at Yale was the Chinese program. They will take you from like, you don't know how to like understand a character to being fluent in three or four years. If you start off not knowing any Chinese and you come in as an outsider, like you can graduate speaking fluent Chinese. And then they have a special trap for students of Chinese American descent. There's Chinese for Chinese speakers. Like they know that we can talk, but we're freaking rice farmers and we can't read. So they put all the Chinese people in that class. And it's great. It's really great with an emphasis on reading and writing. And they like just like, they like smacked our butts because we were like pooping out essays every two weeks, which was pretty intense. Yeah. Uh, what was the question again? What would <laughs> I, mean, I think it was like, how did you figure out what you want to do in life? How do I, how did I figure it out? So it was a lot of bumping, like just bumper cars, some things I liked, some things I really did not like. And yeah. a lot of self, self-awareness along the process. You know, I think that you guys should go into college. If you're watching this as a high schooler or freshman or sophomore in college, it's okay to not know what you want to do. Totally okay. It's okay to graduate and not know what you want to do. But at the very least, guys, I'm going to sound like a older cousin or uncle. Like you guys should have a plan to figure out what you want, right? Have some sort of idea. You can be like, these are the three or four things I'm most passionate about. Let's see if I can actually make a career and living out of this. So for me, it was like, I love education. I love communication as well. Um, some people educate and don't really like, they don't lecture and like a tiny black dot like I do. They educate in different ways. I drew some Venn diagrams. You know, I did that Ikigai, what you love, yes. what you can make money doing, you know, like basic stuff. And my, my friend's mom sat me down though and, and kind of brought that to my attention. I love breakdancing. Will I make a living breakdancing? Probably not. However, okay. comma, can I incorporate breakdancing into like my educational YouTube videos? Probably, yes, with some success. Um, those are the things that like I think about very often. You know, I have some interest in this. You know, I like languages. I like talking about like dating and romance and relationships in college. And you know, interestingly enough, I think that's something that a lot of young people want to know more about. So again, that's like, oh my, I was like, oh my God, I can educate people about this too. Like I didn't, I hadn't seen like a very positively functioning relationship growing up. It would be great to to talk about that or, you know, what are red flags? Like a lot of young people don't even know what red flags are. And when we were growing up, I think even the landscape has change like at my high school now julia uh exeter there there was a lot of sexual assault cases and things like that so they started incorporating mandatory what is it called like situational awareness training to identify a lot of these problems and it's, it's crazy i mean i remember like when we were at yale it, this was also required for us too there was like a drill i'll tell you about really funny where they gave us like little index cards and scenarios and they said kevin it's julia's birthday 
and your job is to ask Julia to go to an ice cream shop where all her friends are uh, are attending for a surprise ice cream birthday party. And then Julia's note card said, under no circumstances are you allowed to go out. You have like an exam, um, you have several papers that are due within a few hours. And it was meant to like get us to talk about like, hey, Julia, you should really, really come to like this ice cream party. And Julia's like, uh, I uh, most definitely cannot come. <laughs> it was like, I think those kinds of situations and, and that, that training, which is so much more uh, accessible to students and just getting those conversations started and in, in a approachable manner is so important. So that, that's kind of a wonky example, but it's one of the most memorable examples I had too. But yeah, those are the things that I'm passionate about. Those are the things that I really want to spend the rest of my life working on. Honestly, if I'm talking about like my mission, my mission mission, what like drives me day in, yeah. day out, what motivates me, I'm really interested in education systems, right? Like it's one thing to, I can, I can help a kid win a writing award. I figured that out. That's great. Honestly, it's like freaking fantastic. However, can I improve like the lives of a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred thousand students? Kind of what I'm trying to do with YouTube, like grow my reach. And the question is, I really want to try to take like the best educational practices from the best institutions in the world. So this could be, this could be Harvard. This could be like the best high school in America. This could be, you know, the best schools in China. Um, this could be like the best athletic training facilities in China and like mm -hmm. create a new modern curriculum where it could be disseminated across the internet and anyone could access this, this education for like less than a hundred bucks, right? Like, isn't that kind of exciting and motivating? I think so. So <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that I think about. Wait, now it's my turn. Let me ask you a question. Yes. Let's return back to high school Julia, present day Julia, or maybe a year or two ago. I want to just know some more details about your high school journey. Like, what do you think was your highest high, your lowest low? Um, maybe you could also give us a little bit of an overview of like semester by semester. Which semester did you think was the hardest? Which one did you think was? Oh, God. Okay, freshman year was definitely rough. I think I didn't really have a good experience in middle school. So that kind of got transferred to like freshman year, sophomore year, middle school. Mm -hmm. And I just remember it was like freshman year was really rough because uh, people kind of made fun of my Chinese name a lot. And it was just like kind of a depressing time freshman year. I didn't really have a lot of self-confidence. The first two semesters were also very rough because I took AP World History freshman year. There's no way I could get an A, it's no matter how hard I try. Just like, I don't even know how I would get an A in that class. That was also rough freshman year. I remember in math class, like, I mean, I asked a lot of questions. I'm a very inquisitive person. I remember like in math class, like kind of like people like, I guess, like made fun of me because I asked a lot of questions. And then sophomore year, I couldn't, I, I mean, I was like, I was like, who cares? Like, it was already at this point, like, I'm, I need to ask questions to like, benefit me like I need to get good grades <laughs> so freshman uh, sophomore year I took AP chemistry and I was the person who also asked a lot of questions but you know I was got the one of the highest grades in the class so people can go in front of me I don't care <laughs> like it's fine I think sophomore year I started like not caring about what other people think of me I guess I also made more friends the one the highlight of high school was I remember getting into this summer program called like Yale Young Global Scholars. And um, I applied my sophomore year and I got in. So I went um, to Yale pretty much almost on the full ride because they have mm. really good financial aid. Like I didn't know at that point that my life would change. But looking back, that point was the point that like my entire like per life perspective changed, I would say. Before that, I like obviously didn't have a lot of confidence. I was like, well, like I want to do things, but like people aren't like passionate in like school clubs and I want to get more involved. Yeah. So I met a lot of probably like the brightest minds in the world at Yale Young Global Scholars from like over like 150 countries. A lot of people who are like very passionate, very smart, shows a lot of initiatives and always so inquisitive and ask so many questions. People like yourself, basically. <laughs> so. People like myself. Yeah, it was, I was like, even like afraid to ask questions. So I was like, oh my gosh, like what if like my questions like wasn't sounding like intelligent enough as like other people. So I was like, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome, but like I overcame that. So after that, the start of my junior year, I was like, wow, I've experienced the time of my life. Junior year, I was just like so many confidence. I really don't care about what other people think. I was like, yeah, you know, I have like so many friends outside of school. Like I don't care. Fun. And then the pandemic hit. And then, and then it actually didn't went down, go downhill from there. I was like, I thought it would go downhill because all my summer plans were ruined. But you know, new opportunities, virtual opportunities that I wouldn't have done if, uh, if this pandemic didn't happen. So that's also another, the highest of 
uh, since that meeting so many people, new people during quarantine. I think Kevin, you and I are kind of similar in that we love to meet new people. Yes, that's great. Wow. So started off, you know, maybe not so hot. And then you ended up at Cornell, which is pretty good. <laughs> so congratulations, uh, Julie. Thank you. Maybe we have time for one more question if you want to ask me something and then we'll wrap it up. For sure, for sure. How did you like manage your finances during college? I know you talked about you made a lot of money during like tutoring. Did you make money like elsewhere? Like how can we take advantage of like making money in college and how do we manage finances and pay all the prices of like food going outside, going out to eat and stuff? For sure, for sure. Yeah, this is a great question. How to manage finances in college. So first yeah. off, get a campus job. Some of the campus jobs are just dumb easy just sit there don't move study and you will make money like there are some library library jobs where you can do just that my friend worked at the gym where all your, your job is to sit at the front desk and make sure like nothing explodes my job was to change the ink in printers to make sure that printers <laughs> don't explode 14 bucks an hour got raised all the way to 16 bucks an hour we we're making good money because like you just sit there and you could rack up like 30 hours a week and make like a couple hundred bucks i mean this is bad this is very bad but this guy here would tutor while also working his like student tech job, <laughs> like making double money, like tutoring wow. the, the student tech job, which is a huge no, no. That's like not good. There are lots of opportunities. Like literally colleges have funds where they just set aside a crap load of money for broke goons like you and I, <laughs> so that when we get to college, we can work an easy job to pay, to pay our way through. There's a lot of them. Uh, I would say like my friends have worked other jobs too, which were a lot harder. Like I had a friend who worked at Chipotle. I think she made like eight bucks an hour and she was working for tail off versus me. I was just like fat chilling in the library. I mean, you know, we would, we would literally be working in the library because people use a lot of print, printing paper mm -hmm. and ink in the library. So we would have to mm -hmm. refill those pretty often, but pretty often is like once an hour, twice an hour, maybe. That is the making money job component. I mean, I work like two or three jobs throughout college. Just try like a few, figure out what you like. Maybe you can do research and you get paid to do research and get a relationship with a professor and, you know, two steps down the road, they end up writing you a recommendation letter and you get sent off to grad school. So mm -hmm. you want to think a little strategically as well. There's so many jobs to choose from. Like I'm telling you hundreds of jobs, hundreds of jobs on every college has their own database where you can look it up and they'll tell you how much money you make when you're going to work, where you're going to work. So be smart, like look at the campus map, figure out like, I want to work here where it's like a five minute walk from my other class. And it's very easy. The best thing you can do is also ask older students for recommendations. That is major hack. And they were like, oh yes, Kevin, please do this job. 18 bucks an hour. You do nothing. Nothing, Kevin. Listen to me closely. You want a cluster technician, not a student technician. Student technicians actually do stuff. They like fix computers and shit. That's hard. Don't do that. Be the cluster tech where you sit on your fat butt in an armchair and you look at the printer, print stuff. Yes, that's the job you want. I was Go like, make friends. Go make good friends. Go make good friends. Yeah, yeah. Make, make one or two friends who are FGLI. Uh, a couple years ahead of you, they'll spill all the tea. Um, they'll know better than me, right? Because it's unique to each college. Uh, the second part of the question was about managing finances. There's a few books that you guys should read. Start with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. The only thing, like literally the major takeaway from that book is every time you guys make money, every time you make a dollar, take out like 10 cents immediately and invest it. That's it. Take out that money before you pay rent, okay? Take out that money before you pay taxes. You have to invest. That is the first thing you have to do. And I would say that habit is the most important thing. So if you, I mean, if you guys can't manage 10 bucks, you're not going to be able to manage 10,000 bucks or like 10 million bucks. I'll tell you that. I started my retirement fund right when I hit 18, immediately. So this was like one year into college. As soon as I made that paycheck, it was automatic. That's the beautiful thing. There's so many like robotic, they call them robo taxes, robo finance apps. Um, the one that I use is called Betterment, B-E-T-T-E-R. M-E-N-T, Betterment. And yeah, it's like super automatic. It will just take money out every single week um, and put it in an account. That's kind of level one. Level two is you slowly raise that. So let's say in the beginning, you take 10 cents out of every dollar. Maybe later on, you start taking 15 cents or you take 20 cents. Or like, look, if you're making $100 and it costs you $30 to survive, you can take out like a lot more money. That's what I did. So when my income increased, I didn't increase my expenditures. I was like, all right, I mean, I'll still, I have big trips that I want to save up for. You know, I have a few things, food that I like to buy. And then, you know, this concept of just taking 10 cents out, like you have the dollar, 10 cents <laughs> goes to investment, 10 cents immediately goes to savings. They just disappear. So really it's like 80 cents appeared in your bank account. That's kind of the way you should be thinking about it. And you're like, okay, now with this 80 cents, like I can do what I want. So that's, I think the number one thing. I would say the other major tactic to focus on is really focus on watermelons and not watermelon seeds. 
So what I mean by that is people will be like running around like, oh, how can I save like 10 bucks on this book? Versus like, bro, you could move houses and save hundreds of dollars each month. You know what I mean? Those things deserve a lot of thought. But like, should I spend an extra three bucks on coffee? Buy the freaking coffee. You know, so those are general suggestions I have. I mean, I could make a whole video series. I can make a whole play. You should. Oh my gosh. There you go. Another video idea. Yeah. All right, <laughs> love, fine. Oh my gosh. It. Love, love, love to hear about finances and like I'll do it. I'll do it. Roth IRA and like different things. Julie's demanding it. Yeah. I mean, especially if you start when you're 18 versus like 25, that's a yeah. difference of like tens, tens of thousands of dollars down the road really. All right. We'll end it there. Power of Tom Pendle. Yeah. Thank you so much, Julia, for joining me at your Thank you for having house. Me. spring break. Just started taking time out of your, you know, very precious spring break senior year to come chat with me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Do you have any final words to say, Julia, before we sign off? Yeah, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for um, having this um, interview, a two-way interview. Yeah. I think you guys all should just go watch, go binge all of Kevin's videos. I think they're all very worthwhile to watch. Oh, thank and you. yeah, that. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we'll catch you at the next one. Okay, bye. Bye.